Okay. Uh, members of the audience. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Please, Line uh, up at the please go to the microphones. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself, since we've done such a good job introducing ourselves, that would be gracious. Hi, I'm Eric. Um, this is a question for Craig. What have you learned working in IT at Google? What have I learned? Well, <laughs> I've just got, pick out a couple. Little. We've, got, we've got 10 years um, to, to cover. I'll do it in 10 seconds. No, I think um, what I've learned, I'm going to... I, I get to choose exactly what that question means. Um, um, and I will choose to bring it, you know, to the top kind of topic of this, of this panel. I think, you know, what I've learned is that the kinds of things that, that you do in a job are very different from the kinds of things that you do in a university. And um, it's interesting for me to reflect that universities don't try to be job training programs. They're trying to to do something else, yet it seems to me that some of the kinds of life skills that are that are important in jobs are also interesting questions for universities, and, and ones I think that they'll start to explore more as we as we move the way that we think of learning. Uh, thanks, Chris Queen. I'd like to uh, reinforce this concern about the links as a distraction, especially since our focus is higher education. And we are trying to teach students to focus on a topic and to limit the topic, especially if they're planning the term paper or an essay or a dissertation, and to um, pare away all the possible links and connections and really focus on a problem. And some metaphors for that, for example, are perhaps, you know, the, the surgical room where, you know, everything gets draped except the part of the body that's being operated on, uh, or, you know, planning a paper where you're telling the student to forget all these things. But it's so much more difficult now when even reading a quasi-research tool like Wikipedia because all the linked words are in blue. And so it stops even the flow of the sentence. And almost <laughs> you're so tempted to see. And you're or either reading the New York Times and you hit a word like Bill Clinton. Are you going to click on that, find out who Bill Clinton <laughs> is? You know, so pretty soon you've lost all kinds of time and forgotten why you were reading that particular article. And uh, finally, as, as a professor of religion, you know, meditation teaches you to let all these silly links go by and you come back to your breath so that you can become much more awake, much more aware, much more enlightened, because you learn that most of those links are useless. I'll, t I'll take that as a, as a comment rather than a question. <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm Peter Kugel, and I was wondering about that first part of the title of this talk, about no more teachers. We heard a lot about how there's not going to be any more books but we really don't need teachers if all you're going to do is lecture. Why can't I just go to Google and say I need an introductory lecture in economics and take that from the best university in the country and let the teachers do something else? What do you, what do you think the future of teachers is? Like write papers, for example. Yes. <laughs> Sherry? I, see, I, I really don't think that teachers, uh, you know, my idea of being a teacher is, is really not what I do in my lectures. It's really that I form relationships with my students and I really try to turn them into I, I, I think that a good, le I mean, I, again, the, an the ancient verities. I, I think that a, a good lecture, in, you know, in a, in, in not, I don't just mean lectures, but lectures and seminars, you're, you're for, I, I believe in long distance learning. I think it has a, you know, tremendous value. I mean, I'm, but, but, but what's good about being in a classroom with students is you form a relationship based on their actually watching you think through a problem. And um, I, I think there will always be a place that we should again, you know, cherish. I mean, you know, David was saying that the rare things become things you cherish, but really that you cherish of, of nurturing students by having them see that you're thinking through a problem in front of them. And I, I, I think I, that watching that happen in the room when it's happening is, you know, is something that I got out of my undergraduate experience and that made me, has inspired me for the rest of my life. I, I, have, to, I have to just offer some homage to one of my teachers uh, because it was in this very room that I uh, watched Rogers Albritt and philosophy professor uh, teach uh, Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations. In those days, you could smoke during lectures. So he, so part of his, part of his um, act was 
you know, to put a cigarette in his mouth, to strike a match, and then, and then have a, a, a thought. And, you know, we were all riveted on the match burning down, and he was struggling with this idea. And we were, it was, everybody was, you know, there were 400 people transfixed by this. And then, he, you know, he got it, and he put this one, he went on, anyway, yes. The, 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 this is, the, the cigarette, unfortunately, can't be part of the, 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 the physical presence anymore, but the physical presence remains valuable. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Jamie Frankel, and I'm a professor here in the Extension School. I've been an adjunct professor at Harvard. I've been a student at both Harvard and MIT. Um, and I had a few comments. First of all, the notion of interruptions and devices, there's always been a tension between specific devices for a particular purpose and general purpose devices. And I think we're gonna to continue to see that tension. So it could be that uh, reading a book, reading fiction, will be just as engaging and without interruption, potentially, even using an electronic device. So there's nothing that says that you have to do that on a device that has the interruptions of Facebook and Twitter and email and so forth. Um, I had three other, three other comments I wrote down. Uh, one of them was specifically about Sherry's comment about education, I've always felt, um, my background is in computer science, and I've always felt that it has been a travesty that someone could graduate with an undergraduate degree, let alone a graduate degree in computer science, and not understand the underlying principles, uh, how computers work, how a compiler works, and how an operating system works. The things that let them understand how the computers can do the higher level functionality that they're used to seeing. And that's one of the reasons that I teach those areas. I teach computer architecture operating systems and compilers here at the Extension School. Um, and these haven't always been the most... Uh, Jamie, uh, there, there are a lot of people in mind. So okay, so sexy class question, or but I think they're important. Um, as far as the interaction for uh, people working together in groups, I think it's sort of uh, not particularly surprising that technology areas have uh, often been attractive to geek-like personalities who often don't have social skills. And I think the same social skills you see in those people interacting with each other are the same ways you see them building software, which often doesn't look forward to the way people will be maintaining that software in the future. Um, and I think for the extension school here in particular, I'm going to leave us with one question, which is that the notion of interaction as a group, and especially from our students, I think that that is uh, more of an issue for us in extension studies because most students just come in and go home. And there's even a little bit more interaction in traditional classes. And I think it's important that we think of some way of encouraging that, even more so in distance education. Yeah. My name is Eric Kupferberg. I um, actually took a few classes from Sherry some years ago. Uh, I've also been an instructor at the Extension School for three years and I'm a senior assistant dean at Northeastern. Personally, I oversee 1,500 students, of which three quarters take classes online. I oversee 200 faculty, of which three quarters teach online. And what I'm not hearing here is how to teach online. And th just very quickly, um, there are, there's a question about teacher roles and how to sort of manage this, this vast degree of education. There's three tools that are common on pretty much all of the teaching platforms. I'll take Blackboard because it's the largest. Um, the trick is to teach that knowledge on the internet is not ready-made, but it's in the making. And there's three different ways of doing it. The first is that you as an instructor can guide students along during the course of the week at their own pace through a bunch of different websites. And stop, comment, have them go someplace else, stop, comment, link into two different directions, have a segment of a public speech that's in one area, comment, go back to a different discussion. So as a result, you're a tour guide, but also someone who has in-depth knowledge of the field allows them to negotiate what is online. Second, is that this is the traditional discussion board. The instructor provides a lecture, hopefully not in a printed format, either for, you know, videoed or podcasted or flash presentations. You run three or four different questions, ask the students to respond to them. As a result, if you have 15 students in the class, you have 15 different answers to three of those questions. You then ask the students to respond to other students. You can do the geometry here, right? The teacher cannot answer each one of the, the posts and responses. Rather, the teacher sort of moves the stream of discussion in one direction or another, stops and says, look, let's switch back to this topic. I think we're missing something, or we've beaten this to a dead horse, 
right? So as a result, you don't serve as um, a hub and spokes of a wheel like you would a bad teacher might in a discussion in class where all the sections, all the questions go to the teacher and the teacher back out again, but you actually let the class move collectively through. Last method, and this is one of my favorite, is to use a wiki. One of the great parts about wikis, particularly if you teach online and you teach week by week, and material opens up on a Sunday night, they have Sunday to complete it, is that you can create a series of problems that the students have to collectively come up with answer to. But they do it individually, right? And they structure it. So as the week goes on, you have a wiki that's get built. As an instructor, even if the answers are correct, you can use it much like um, pickup sticks. Right? You pile a bunch of different pieces of knowledge together, and the instructor starts pulling out portions of it and says, here's where we might have gone wrong. You know, the great parts about wikis is that there's a number of different truths and falsehoods that get built into them. And as an instructor, you can pull back layer by layer, person by person, or day by day, and say, here's where we have gone right, here's where we have gone wrong. By the way, I never thought of these three or four sticks on top of each other. Yes, go ahead. Oh, I, I, um, so, uh, so that's part of the uh, um, answer, it may in fact be the entire answer, to the earlier comment um, pointing out the value of having a student simply focus and write a paper, which is a very valuable skill and, and exercise. But if you're, uh, uh, so this is an additive thing, right? So, um, so if the topic is uh, uh, write a paper about the causes of the Civil War, there's value in doing it that way. There's also value in, for example, sending a group of students off to do a wiki um, in which they pull together lots of different pieces in just the way that you said. And one of the further advantages of doing that, in addition to advancing the cause of learning together, is that um, if you want, they can do it in public. And so learning also becomes a public act that adds back into the world and makes the world just a little bit, you know, tiny little one trillionth of a bit better. We're now entering the lightning round uh, because uh, you can hear the, hear the little bell indicating the uh, beginning of the lightning round. Uh, I'm going to extend this a little bit more just because there are so many people who, who want to get a word in, but I would beg you try to keep your uh, comments to you know, 10 or 20 seconds. Thank you. Hi, I'm Zach Stone. I'm a PhD student in computer science here. I'd like to pick up on a word that's been threaded through this discussion, which is interaction. And it seems that interaction is one of the reasons that universities still exist because it can be uh, inspiring and motivating and challenging and illuminating. And as Craig mentioned, interaction will probably be a larger part of what happens online in the future, but we haven't figured out yet how to get billions of people to have a useful conversation. As you can see by looking at the comment list on your average blog, it's not always a high quality conversation. Um, so my question for the panelists is, will technology allow us to assemble an instantaneous classroom uh, on any topic at any time. So if right now you want to understand a particularly challenging passage in Shakespeare, can technology help us find 20 other people who have similar preparation as you, similar questions as you, motives as you, bring you together through this network, maybe even with a teacher who's an expert on that particular thing, and move that batch learn, bring that batch forward together. Can, can technology help us learn together in a new way? I love this idea of a flash mob for studying Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah. I think it's totally possible. Let's do it after this, uh, after this panel. Great. <laughs> I, I think this gets built into the reading device or the reading software. Uh, that's what it means to read socially. Yeah. A lot of this is actually software and user interface stuff that, um, that I think will evolve. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Keith Donaldson, and I uh, run a software company called MollySim that develops educational software, primarily for primary and secondary education. Uh, one of the things we're working on is a dynamic textbook. And a feature, we get a couple feature requests all the time, and one is to translate that, in, translate that textbook into multiple languages. And that's cool, I get that. Uh, the second one is uh, to change the reading level dynamically based on uh, the student that you get reading that textbook, and I wonder how you feel about that. Anybody want to make any comment? No? Sounds like a good research problem. Um, yeah, great idea. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm a web developer at Harvard. Um, on the the right, I sorry, I forgot your name. You talked a lot about technology just as a simulation or a distraction uh, from the real world or a simulation in the real world, um, and. 
as a web developer, you know, I create beautiful works of art, I hope, every day. And I see a lot of amazing stuff that was created on computers, for computers. Um, and there's, there's a lot of great things out there that are using technology as an end in itself, not just as a simulation for something else. Um, do you believe that technology as an end in itself uh, is is useful or necessary or good oh, in education? Absolutely. I mean, there are, there are works that are created. I mean, if you go to a place like uh, uh, Second Life, there are works of art that are created in Second Life that are meant to be appreciated and cherished within Second Life. Um, I, I know I, simu the, the kind of issues in simulation that concern me is when we're making decisions about the real based on models where we need to be aware of their limitations as well as their strengths. And I think that, that, that kind of critical use of simulation really is, that's one of the big jobs of the university, how to think critically about simulation, which obviously my young, and I really support the, the gentleman who is teaching um, you know, the, the underpinnings of computer science. I think that's part of the problem that we don't always know how to fix code when we find the problems in it. But absolutely, yes. I mean, I, I don't think I'd call it technology for, as the end in itself, but certainly that we create objects in the techno, you know, in simulation that are deserved to be cherished, absolutely. I've, I'd also like to add that I know how to use a slide rule, and I've made plenty of mistakes on one of those as well. So. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we may not get to everybody, but we'll, uh, we'll take a couple more. Um, hi, my name is Sierra, and I'm a student at Boston University. And um, I know that we're talking about technology in, as far as the uni university college level. But I was wondering, do you think maybe it would be much easier for students, especially freshmen, to be used to um, become used to all the technology in a university setting if maybe it was applied more in, like during the high school years? That way we kind of have time to sort it out more and get used to it and not have it thrust upon us now? Or do you think it should strictly be in a university setting? I have strong feelings here. I think it was a very big, uh, uh, I don't want to say a mistake, but let me say a big mistake to, um, to move so quickly away from teaching uh, things about computers, including programming, including the nature of computation, uh, to, using so to using kind of computer, to the tool model of software uh, in K through 12. I think that happened. There are historical reasons it happened. But I think we should step back and say, listen, we are in early days and maybe that needs to be revisited. Because I think a lot of the issues we're raising here would be better served by a university, uh, you know, by incoming freshmen who really understood the nature of the technology itself, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I'm Frank White, I teach in the Extension School here as well. And I just wanted to make a distinction between distributing knowledge and distributing education. Uh, I think that distance education as it's practiced here is a, dis a distribution of education globally. And to me, it seems like it's one of the tools we have that could really make the world a better place. Uh, I think the extension school, the way it's doing distance ed, is a symbiosis really between classroom teaching and people learning at a distance. So I, I just wonder how you all feel about finding that middle ground and then using it to really do something significant. I'm in favor. <laughs> <laughs> Any others? I'm in. Okay, I, I'm afraid I know there's a couple more people who want to uh, ask questions, but I've held the audience and the panelists uh, over. So I want to thank you all very much, and I'd like to thank our panelists in particular. What a great discussion. Thank you.